Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today. My name is Bridget Jones, and I am a historian and a historical consultant, and I am working with Humanities Tennessee currently on a wonderful project entitled um, United We Stand, Connecting Through Culture. Um, now, this grant comes from the, the Humanities overall, the National Endowment for the Humanities, excuse me, um, and they gave these grants to every one of the humanities organizations throughout the United States. And in Tennessee, we decided that we wanted to focus on issues that we think are pertinent to the state of Tennessee. With that being said, for West Tennessee, we're going to focus on racial reconciliation. For those of you who know anything about the history of West Tennessee, being a Memphian myself, I know that race has always been an issue as far as honestly, as far as the state of Tennessee goes. So we want to address that. We want to address how we can make things better and really shed some light on some issues that are both historic and current. Um, but before we begin, I want to share an amazing video uh, that kind of sheds a little bit of light on some of the history of people who have really tried to combat some of these issues in the past. And that person is Ida B. Wells. And Ida B. Wells was an advocate for change. Ida B. Wells is definitely one of the people whose shoulders that any activist, any historian, any journalist still stands on today. Now, this video comes to us from courtesy of the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute at the University of Memphis. And uh, the Hooks Institute's mission is teaching, studying, and promoting civil rights and social change. Now, this video will give you a little bit of insight into the work that Ms. Wells was doing in her time in Memphis, but also give some light onto a very important incident that happened in the city of Memphis in the late 1800s. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and tune into the video. I hope you enjoy, and we'll see you all later for our wonderful conversation. The Civil War was over. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution ended slavery, guaranteed citizenship, and expanded voting rights to African Americans. African Americans looked upon the future with optimism. Freedom to enslaved Africans meant a whole, you know, a whole new world, but it meant something completely different to white segregationists. They were not used to this and they wanted to take this liberty away, this freedom away from African-Americans. In the late 19th century, Memphis was a bustling city on the banks of the Mississippi River. Memphis was an ideal home for Ida B. Wells, a teacher turned journalist from Northern Mississippi. She co-owned a successful newspaper, The Free Speech and Headlight, located on Bill Street in downtown Memphis. Wells published articles in the paper to expose injustices against African-Americans. She was unrelenting. Um, she was a fighter. She was courageous. Um, she was very independent. She was a feminist before feminism was in mode. In March 1892, Thomas Moss, a friend of Wells, was murdered at the hands of a mob. This would change her life forever. Thomas Moss, in so many ways, sort of was emblematic of what was happening, of the rise of Blacks uh, in the South. He did everything one just had to, to do to, uh, to, to rise, uh, and was just a, a sterling citizen. Everybody in town knew and loved Tommy, an exemplary young man. He was married and the father of one little girl, Maureen, whose godmother I was. He and his wife, Betty, were the best friends I had in town. And he believed, with me, that we should fight wrong whenever we saw it. Moss, a mail carrier by day, was a part owner of the People's Grocery, an African-American-owned cooperative store. The People's Grocery was located in South Memphis at an area known as the Curve. It was uh, seen as a outstanding thing in the black community uh, because it gave them an opportunity to, first of all, patronize their own 
uh, uh, people. And it helped to sort of uh, infuse the belief that Black entrepreneurship could flourish in Memphis. The success of the People's Grocery escalated economic tensions with William Barrett, a white grocery store owner whose business was also in the area. In early March of 1892, a game of marbles escalated into a fight among African-American and white children who were playing outside the People's Grocery. The fight grew quickly. Soon, a large crowd was engaged in a brawl near the cooperative. Allegedly, two employees of the People's Grocery, William Stewart and Calvin McDowell, joined in the skirmish. Barrett tried to get the place shut down, and he went to the authorities in Memphis uh, and reported that the place was a public nuisance. And, of course, the authorities in Memphis at that time were all too willing to accommodate Mr. Barrett. A Shelby County judge deputized William Barrett and a group of white men. The judge gave Barrett permission to take action against those running the people's grocery. Fearing retribution from angry whites, the owners of the people grocery asked for protection from authorities. However, that protection was refused. On March 5, 1892, Barrett and his men armed themselves and marched towards the people's grocery. The African-American man who owned the people's grocery had gotten word uh, that authorities were coming uh, to, to look into the charges that had been filed by Mr. Barrett. And so there were several other black men in the store at the time. And sensing that there may be some trouble, they were indeed armed. Law enforcement officials who were not uh, dressed as law enforcement, they were actually dressed in plain clothes, showed up uh, and pretty much raided the place. As a result of the raid, shots were fired. Thomas Moss, Kevin McDowell, and William Stewart were later arrested and held at the Shelby County Jail. Even when they were in jail, uh, there was talk of, of, a, of a lynching that was going to take place because they had uh, shot, shot uh, these deputies. Beginning in the late 19th century, whites used lynchings, horrific and unlawful executions, to terrorize African Americans who challenged white supremacy. Lynching becomes this kind of form of terrorism because it means that no Black person is ever safe. They will not they will not even get to defend themselves if they're accused of crime. African-Americans saw Memphis as a place relatively safe from the practice of lynching. This belief was shattered on March 9, 1892, at around 2.30 a.m., when 75 white men wearing masks surrounded the Shelby County Jail. While they slept, a body of picked men were admitted to the jail, which was a modern Bastille. They took out of their cells Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart, these three officials of the People's Grocery, put them on a switch engine of the railroad, which ran back of the jail, carried a mile north of the city limits, and shot them to death. The newspaper, uh, the appeal avalanche, was tipped off that uh, the men would be taken from their cells. As a matter of fact, a reporter, once he got the tip, showed up and was there to report it all. The ringleaders and the assault on the deputies who raided the curve last Saturday night are missing from their cells in the Shelby County Jail this morning. It is a reasonable inference that Judge Lynch has passed sentence upon them and that this sentence has been executed. Not a gun was fired, not a shot was heard, until they read it in this morning's appeal avalanche, the people living in the vicinity of the jail will not know that the Avengers swooped down last night and sent the murderous souls of the ringleaders in the curve riot to eternity. From the newspaper columns, it was said that Thomas Moss begged for his life for the sake of his wife and child and his unborn baby. That when asked if he had anything to say, told them to tell my people to go west. There was no justice for them here. That Calvin McDowell got a hold of one of the guns of the lynchers 
and that a shot was fired into his closed fist. Where the three bodies were found, the fingers of McDowell's right hand had been shot to pieces, proving that those who wrote the newspaper piece were eyewitnesses or got the facts from someone who was. No one was arrested for these murders. Soon thereafter, an angry white mob ransacked and destroyed the people's grocery. The lynching at the curb was shocking, particularly because the three men who killed, were killed were all well-known, upstanding members of the community, that there was no accusation of any crime. And it made um, Blacks in Memphis, such as Wells, begin to question whether they had any future in Memphis. She was the first one, and a woman, to realize that lynching had its base not in the myth of black men being attracted sexually to white women, but that it was an economic means of keeping the black folk down. She was the first one. I mean, this woman had some brains. Ida B. Wells was furious after the lynchings of these men. Emboldened by this injustice, Wells used her paper, The Free Speech, to confront and condemn whites who supported or ignored racial violence against African Americans. In May 1892, only a few months after the lynchings of Moss, McDowell, and Stewart, an angry mob of whites destroyed Wells' office on Bill Street, where she published the free speech. Wells was out of town during the attack. However, whites threatened to lynch Wells if she returned to the city. Because of this threat, Wells never returned to Memphis to live. Memphis transformed Wells into a champion for civil rights and a crusader against lynching. Her experience in the city would shape her activism the remainder of her life. Excuse me. I want to give a big shout out to the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute at the University of Memphis for sending us that video. We hope you did enjoy it and hopefully learn something. Um, and again, since our conversation today is going to be rooted around exploring Tennesseans' collective imagination as a tool for shaping a safer and more civic life in which all Tennesseans belong, we think that this video really spoke to Ida B. Wells' legacy and her work um, trying to, to to recoil against some of the, the violence that was happening in Tennessee during that time period. Now, moving along with our program today, I want to introduce our wonderful panelists. And we chose panelists that we think can speak to not only the history of the state of Tennessee, but the present and the future of Tennessee from various capacities. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce you to first, Tammy Sawyer, Tammy Sawyer is a former Shelby County Commissioner and the Democratic nominee for Shelby County General Sessions Court Clerk. She's a prominent figure in civil rights activism and holds a master's degree in rhetorical communications. Tammy brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to her advocacy work, and she has held senior leadership positions within notable organizations such as the U.S. Navy, Teach for America, Black Voters Matter, and Amazon. In 2017, Tammy founded Hashtag Take em Down 901, a successful movement dedicated to removing Confederate statues from Memphis. Her commentary has been featured on CNN, Essence, Forbes, and Time. Recognized for her public service, Tammy was named Young Elected Official of the Year in 2022 by People for the American Way and was listed on the Reckon South list and Ebony Power 100 list. 
Tammy's commitment to her community extends beyond activism. She is a dedicated member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, mentors young justice advocates, and co-founded the George Floyd Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP Memphis, demonstrating her de dedication to justice. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Tammy. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Next up on our list is Dr. Aram Goodsusian. Dr. G, as I call him, is the Bizolt Family Professor of History at the University of Memphis, where he teaches courses on the modern American on modern American race, culture, and politics. His books include King of the Court, Bill Russell and the Basketball Revolution, and Down the Crossroads, Civil Rights, Black Power, and the Meredith March Against Fear. Thank you so much, Dr. G, for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for your time. So nice to be here. Thank you, Bridget. And last but certainly not least, we have Laura Faith Kibita Chumasi, uh, and she is a distinguished journalist in residence at the University of Memphis and the Civil Wrongs Coordinator for the Institute for Public Service Reporting. Her award-winning podcast in partnership with WKNO-FM and University of Memphis students examines forgotten cases of racial terror in the Mid-South and analyzes their connection to the present. Laura is also a reporter for AmeriCorp, a report for AmeriCorps member, a former board member of the Lynching Sites Project of Memphis, and is pursuing her master's degree in liberal studies, an interdisciplinary program at the University of Memphis. She previously covered education and equities for Chalkbeat, Tennessee, and local government and religion for the Richmond Times Dispatch. Laura, thank you so much for your time, and we're looking forward to an amazing conversation. Thank you, Bridget. <laughs> All righty. Well, I guess we'll jump right into the questions here. Let's see here. I have way too many tabs open. Please excuse me. I'm going to start off with Dr. G. In efforts of giving our audience a brief refresher on Tennessee history, what does West Tennessee look like for new Black Americans doing Reconstruction and in the early 20th century? How were they working to create a Tennessee that was unique to them? That's an interesting question, Bridget. Thank you. You know, the history of Memphis, as you were alluding to in the introduction, right, it, uh, it can't be separated from the history of race in America. And understanding the growth of Memphis, uh, you have to understand is African American history. Right? Memphis's growth is rooted in the institution of slavery. That helps the the, the city to grow in the, in the prior to the Civil War through the cotton trade, through lumber, um, and uh, the racial dynamic really influences the way the city looks throughout its history. Uh, as a classic example of this, there's the yellow fever epidemic in the, in the 1870s when there's a huge uh, migration out of the city. Uh, and uh, at that point, there's a brief black majority in the city because more African-Americans stay and they essentially help to rebuild the city or are central to rebuilding the city. Um, it's also worth considering that Memphis is, uh, you know, there's a place of political opportunity in the late 19th century. There are black office holders in the 1870s and 1880s, which is mirrored throughout uh, throughout the South. The, Mem the history of Memphis is almost like uh, a history rooted in paradox, because Memphis is both this uh, oasis from the repression of the Mississippi Delta and, and, and the rural areas that surround the city, but it also suffers from what one historian has called the plantation mentality within Memphis itself. Uh, that it is that paternalism, a racial paternalism, in many ways guides the city. Uh, so, so going back to your question, right? Memphis, uh, the, the the patterns of Jim Crow, which which arise around the South in the 1890s, shape Memphis as well. A poll tax is passed in Tennessee, which which leads to a steep decline in black voters and and and, and uh, a decline in black office holding. Um, segregation laws get passed. Tennessee is the first state to have a streetcar segregation law, for instance, uh, and that spreads into segregations of all sorts of public facilities in the 1890s. And as the video was suggesting, right, racial violence is also a key enforcer uh, of, uh, of racial segregation. The lynching at the curve took place in the 1890s, just as these laws were going into place. We could go back 30 years earlier to the so-called Memphis Massacre of 1866 at the dawn of Reconstruction, when there was mob violence that destroyed the South Memphis community. Um, we can look at the lynching in 1917 of Ella Persons, uh, a man who was falsely accused of raping a white girl and his um, severed head was thrown onto, onto Beale Street as a warning to the black community. So in all these ways, Memphis is shaped by this kind of repression, right? But there's also a certain level of opportunity in Memphis. You know, Memphis is a bigger city, for instance, in the early 20th century than cities like Atlanta and Richmond, uh, which later surpass it. There's black owned banks and insurance companies that drive uh, the economic vitality of the city. Beale Street is a center of black culture. 
Uh, and there's black political power. Uh, you know, Robert Church Sr. is the first black millionaire uh, in the South. Uh, and, he's, and he's rooted here in Memphis. Robert Church Jr., his son, builds a black political network in the early 20th century. And it's, again, thinking about the idea of paternalism, uh, the, the, from about 1910 to about 19, into the 1950s, there's a so-called Crump machine here in Memphis. Edward Crump runs the city with an iron fist, so to speak, right? But he also delivers black votes. So you see Memphis is a unique city in the early 20th century because black, uh, because black people are voting in substantial ways, which you don't see in any other city in the South. Now, they have to vote in the context of paternalism. Do they, if they support Crump's candidates, then the Crump machine pays their poll taxes, gets them to the polls, uh, supports them. And, they, and, in reality, and in return, the black community gets certain political favors uh, that, and, and certain el small elements of political power, as long as it's within the larger context of that white paternalist power. And so Robert Church Jr. is able to vault into national significance as a result of this. He, he the first uh, uh, branch of the NAACP in the South is started by Robert Church Jr. in Memphis in the aftermath of the L. Persons lynching. In the 1920s, he starts something called the Lincoln League, which, which uh, is designed to create, on a national level, black support for the Republican Party. So while Church is supporting the Republican Party on a national level, he's working with Crump, a Democrat, within Memphis. So there's this kind of negotiation of political power that exists in this period. So to answer your question, right, black Memphians suffer from the same issues that, that African Americans in the South and the nation suffer from across the board. But there's certain leveraging of, of, of power within this paternalist context that is also sort of a key defining element of Memphis's history. That's interesting. It makes me think of, from what I'm hearing that there's always been this sort of push and pull between essentially black and white Memphians and West Tennesseans in general for that power um, and, and political power being some of the most important power because without the political power, so many of our freedoms we would not have. And it took black people, black residents and black citizens to come together and say, we have to have this political power to be able to create the, the equality that we need for ourselves because essentially they weren't just gonna give it to them. They had to actually go and, and get it themselves. And that takes us right into our next question, actually. Ms. Sawyer, as the 20th century lends itself to the civil rights movement, what individuals and organizations throughout West Tennessee are pivotal to the work being done in the political arena to secure a semblance of justice and equality? And I know Dr. G just hinted on a few of them. Are there any that stand out specifically to you that you'd like to speak on? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to say first that one thing that stood out to me in the video that we just watched, and again, shout out to uh, the Ben Hooks Institute at the University of Memphis, uh, was the fact that um, Tommy Moss and, and the others were arrested and held at Shelby County Jail. Um, and as Dr. G just mentioned, when we think about uh, the limitations placed on Black people through uh, political violence to keep them from voting or, or to get them to vote in certain type of ways, one of uh, the stories that I always uh, love to explore is uh, when Boss Crump takes the Black men off Bill Street uh, during the flood of the, is it 34, Dr. G? 37. 37, thank you. I knew I was close, but the flood of 37 um, and uses the police force um, to take uh, men who are just out for, you know, the weekend, going on dates, attending shows uh, to um, put sandbags on the levees. And so the first organization that I would call out is the police and the justice system. Um, not call out in a good way, of course, but for us to get to a semblance of justice in Tennessee and West Tennessee, there have to be reforms in policing. Uh, just today, um, students were arrested and then suspended from school at Vanderbilt University for using their First Amendment right uh, to protest. And they were arrested during this protest, A um, a, a um, news photographer was arrested during this pro protest. Um, and so policing and, um, and, and reforms are going to be very important. There's no justice if our policing system continues as is. Um, 
And then I'll say as far as organizations on the ground, the Equity Alliance is doing amazing work um, across the state of Tennessee um, and most directly with uh, political candidates and grassroots organizations in Nashville and in Memphis, um, electing candidates and holding them uh, and I could say this myself, holding them accountable once they're elected. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that will help people get into the office, and that's the churn that they're a part of. Um, what I appreciate about what the Equity Alliance is doing is that once you're elected, they are still expecting um, you to hold the line on progressive values. They will evaluate your vote. They will call you out. They will make sure that you are engaged uh, with constituents and uh, families and ensuring that you are um, working for liberation uh, across the state. Uh, the work of Turk, uh, immigration ref Tennessee immigration uh, reform is is going to be vitally important as we want to continue to be one of the fastest growing locations for immigrants in the South. Uh, not many people, you know, realize Memphis has one of the fastest growing uh, immigrant populations in Tennessee. Um, and I believe the fastest growing Latinx population uh, in Tennessee. And so human rights organizations related to immigration rights uh, are vitally important right now. The work that Turk is doing uh, as we speak to organize against Bill Lee's attempt to force, excuse me, Governor Bill Lee's um, I have to remember to use respect in public. Uh, Governor Bill, <laughs> Governor Bill Lee's attempt to force police departments to corroborate with ICE, uh, regardless of um, admission of guilt, you know, or even a, a, any evidence of guilt um, in any type of activity, um, and. Uh, so right now, Turk is 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 organizing not just candidates, but communities uh, to stand up against that uh, forced um, um, cooperation between city and county governments and, and the actions of ICE. Um, just, I would say about five, six years ago, we saw one of the largest deportation efforts uh, happen right outside of Nashville, uh, where children went to school. And by the time they got home uh, over 150 children's parents were gone from the state um, because they were working at a plant uh, for uh, less than minimum wage and ICE conducted a raid and did not allow these families to be reunited. And when we destabilize communities and homes in that way under the guise of correct immigration standards, um, we are even further destabilizing our own state uh, these are children that the state now has to provide for, does not have the resources uh, to accurately provide for. Shout out to Laura Faith, who will tell you, does not provide education for children uh, at the level that they should anyway. Um, and now they have burdened these children with being without their parents um, in, in, in a state and a country with which they are unfamiliar. Uh, I could go on and on, but those are two organizations that I really like to shout out because, I mean, as we speak, both are actively uh, working against uh, what we see as a very dangerous authoritarian, uh, post-apocalyptic, if you ask me, because I'm an apocalypse nerd, uh, post-apocalyptic uh, government and the actions that we're seeing right now. I could not agree more. And to echo you, big shout out to the Equity Alliance. I'm a Tennessee State grad. So um, I'm very, very familiar with Tequila and the work that her, her organization and her colleague um, is doing politically. The It's needed, to say the least. Um, also, big shout out to Turk. Uh, we're looking to work with them and our Middle Tennessee component of this project. So wholeheartedly agree. The work that both of these organizations are doing is, is beyond needed. It's necessary. Um, now, when we think about this historically and think about these issues historically, we know that propaganda has always been a thing with how we view people and how we view people um, impacts how we interact with people. Um, and the proper the propaganda that surrounds communities of color, uh, black communities specifically, uh, as we speak in this type, this context, has never really painted black folks in a, a great light. Um, and so for you, uh, Ms. Chumasi, when we think about propaganda 
and how it has inaccurately depicted and misrepresented Black bodies and their experience for centuries. In your opinion, what is the impact and the role of Black journalists and non-biased media as it relates to the, the plight of Black West Tennesseans then and now? Yeah, um, I think it's a huge issue because, like you said, um, when it comes to um, how media portrays a community that affects how people um, view their own community. That's one of the reasons I wanted to go into journalism for good reasons of like being able to introduce communities to each other, people that they may not um, uh, interact with on a daily basis. And so it has a potential for good, but um, historically there's been a lot of harm done by media to not give full accurate um, depictions of communities, especially Black communities. And um, I think when it comes to um, the video that we just saw, uh, IDB Wells uh, cut through the propaganda to recognize, because um, I mean, as she mentioned in some of her own diaries, that initially she bought the propaganda that it was that lynchings were mostly fueled by rapes um, from black men, men to white women. Um, but as she experienced the loss of her friend um, through lynching and recognized that actually um, there's a, a deeper narrative here that wasn't being exposed at the time. And so not only did she use that one experience to give her a clue to what was going on, she systematically started going through um, newspapers and documenting lynchings and investigating the actual reasons. She even hired um, private investigators, sometimes white private investigators, to ask questions in the white community that she wouldn't be able to get answers from um, so that she could get a, a more accurate narrative. And so um, I think it takes a lot of um, critical thinking, a lot of uh, not just accepting um, the narratives from authorities, which is something that media professionals still struggle with today. Um, I think a, a really big um, conversation right now among media is about how, how do we cover um, public safety and criminal justice in a way that doesn't just accept um, at face value what police uh, put out, but being able to go beyond just the press release that's put out and be able to um, uh, highlight when there's inconsistencies, uh, being more embedded in communities to be able to recognize when things don't quite line up. Because as we've seen, especially over the past decade or so, um, the the first press release that that came out about George Floyd, for example, was nothing like what actually happened um, that we saw on video. Um, and so being able to recognize that we can't just take at face value what comes down from authorities and um, which has always been the, um, uh, at least, well, not always, I should say, um, for decades has been the, the goal of journalism is to uh, hold accountable public officials. But now I think there's an even deeper conversation of how to um, uh, hold all public officials accountable, not just because they're police, that we take it at face value. Mm -hmm. Now, when you said a lot of things that, that trigger a lot of things in me when I think about collective memory, because how we see media and how we see history depicted on television, um, whether that be on the big screen in the movies or just in regular day-to-day -day television, that kind of affects how we think about and how we view history. Um, and all of this is a part of media, unfortunately. Now, Dr. G, as a historian, based on the socio-historic uh, trends in West Tennessee, when we think about like collective memory and its role on how we view the past, the present, and the future, um, can you speak to where West Tennessee may be on the path to go in the future based on how we are or aren't coming together right now? Interesting. Um, we talk, you mentioned collective memory, Bridget, right? Mm -hmm. If we think, what's our collective memory of, of the civil rights movement in Memphis? Everybody goes to one moment, right? To April mm -hmm. 4, 1968. Yep. Um, as this, obviously, a moment of, of incredible tragedy and one that 
uh, really has a profound effect upon the city itself in terms of how it sees itself and how it sees its future and how it sees its race relations. Um, but as historians, we seek to uncover a deeper past, right? And we can see that Memphis had quite a vibrant civil rights movement. Uh, that you know, Memphis was defined by the same sit-ins and, and, and protests and, and marches for labor rights and um, nonviolent action and, and black power organizations. And, I, and you know, the, the, the history of the civil rights movement in Memphis is, is wrapped up in it. It was also something of a crossroads for organizers going into Mississippi and Arkansas and Fayette County and, and so on. Um, you know, so Memphis had you know, a very vibrant civil rights movement is, is, is the point here. And that civil rights movement had important legacies, right? It, it built something that was that was significant. You think about it in terms of economic growth, right? The growth of the black middle class uh, that emerges out of the civil rights movement. If you can think about it in terms of uh, political power, of course, right? That you have a huge number uh, or great surge in black office holding uh, in the aftermath of the civil rights movement. Uh, you can think about it in terms of the way that Memphis's culture is defined by so many of its of its black citizens. Think about music, right? Think about Stax Records and Isaac Hayes. Think about sports and, and the ambassadors from Larry Finch to Penny Hardaway. Um, but Memphis at the same time, in the post-civil rights era, right? One of the great uh, defining characteristics of Memphis in a lot of ways has been racial polarization, racial division, right? Um, our recent crisis uh, in the aftermath of the killing of Tyree Nichols. Uh, this speaks to something that Tammy was speaking about earlier, right? Um, the, you know, the history of police brutality is, is one that, that stretches back. Uh, Tammy mentioned 1930s, the 1937 flood. I thought, think of the 1971 killing of a man named Elton Hayes, uh, a young teenager uh, who was shot by police in cold blood and it was covered up and it led to, to great protests. Uh, you know, schools is, of course, one of the, one of the key defining um, issues uh, in Memphis. And, and Memphis goes through what you might call school resegregation uh, in the 1970s. Uh, after there's uh, there's a court mandated uh, integration of schools and, and a busing program put into place, it's quite controversial. That's when we see white flight into the suburbs. Uh, that's when you see city school resegregation. Uh, I have a statistic here that there were 77 white majority schools in Memphis in 1973. Three years later, three years later, there were three white majority uh, schools in the city. Um, and there's political polarization, right? Um, now, with black political power. That creates new opportunities. Think about the political machine built, for instance, by Harold Ford Sr., uh, who successfully runs for Congress uh, and then was succeeded by his son, Harold Ford Jr. Uh, uh, Willie, uh, Willie Harrington, uh, the first black mayor in 1991. But at the same time, you know, if you read Otis Sanford's book, Otis, who was in the, uh, the video that we saw at the beginning, his book from Boss Crump to King Willie, uh, he talks a lot about the political elections in the 70s and 80s when uh, there's momentum for a black mayor, as, as you see in, in cities th uh, throughout the country, but it keeps getting checked by, you know, whites banging behind one candidate to, to defeat the black candidate or, um, uh, or or instances where there's race baiting in the election to try to deflate the black, the black candidate in, in various aspects. So these are all sort of troubling aspects of, of, of this, right? the sort of racial division. But the good news is that, you know, if, to think about how we move forward, Bridget, to go back to your question, mm -hmm. the good news is that if we know what our flaws are, we can seek to correct them, right? We can we can talk in terms of issues that if we say that we're helping the children in Memphis City Schools, we're not just helping one element of our community, we're helping the city, right? right. Uh, we, can, we can take progressive policies and progressive visions and talk about them in terms of how they benefit the larger public, right? How they, how, they, how, they benefit, how they don't, this isn't, the politics is not a zero sum game in other words, right? Which is how, which is how some people would like, would like us to have it. Um, and that's become a harder task, frankly, in the last, in the Trump era, so to speak, right? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the sense that here are two sides that seem like they have nothing in common and see each other pitted as enemies uh, in, in a way that's much deeper than it was even a couple decades ago. But that's what makes it all the more important. Right. How do we because most people are still willing to think in terms of the, of the larger public if the political officials put it before them. So, you know, the bad news in a lot of ways is the way that we're defined by this racial line uh, in politics and culture and economics. The good news is that there's people who seek to transcend that uh, and we should try to support those people to the best that we can. And do you mind if I add uh, something real quick? Uh, just I, I mean, everything that you said. Um, just really resonated with me. And um, I think when talking about collective memory, it, um, and when you mentioned about Tyree Nichols, 
Um, I thought of uh, the class that I taught last semester or last spring, um, just as that was all unfolding. Um, we were working on um, a podcast about the Memphis Massacre of 1866, which happened just right after the Civil War, and which was based in police brutality. And A, these students, I had 13 students, several of them who have grown up in this um, area who didn't know about that. And um, their main question over and over that semester was, why don't we know about this history? Why don't we know? And then the second question, which I got really excited about this as they asked it more was, what else don't I know? Um, which really is the point of education, right? To be able to um, learn more around you and then recognize, wow, there is so much more I don't know. How can I go out and, and learn more? Um, and as they saw those two parallels of the police brutality of 1866, and um, how traces of that have been throughout not just Memphis history, but American history, but they specifically focused on that, that trail um, that Dr. G was talking about um, all the way up until Tyree Nichols and being able to recognize um, we, we, don't, we don't have to just kind of sit back and say, how did we get here? We can actually have answers to that. And when you have answers to that, you can understand how we can make better decisions in the future. Mm -hmm. Wholeheartedly agree. Especially when we think about the, from your perspective, the legacy of, of journalism and storytelling. Um, and we see that nowadays with the plethora of, of black led and, and, and people of color led editorials and magazines and publications. We have Jet Historically, Essence, Ebony, BET, Blavity, the shade room these days, we're in charge of our narrative. And I think that it's important that we continue to be to make sure that we're educating the youth on what the stories are that matter to our people and our culture. Because if we don't tell the stories, they won't get told. And we've seen that happen too often in the past. Um, now, when we think about the timeline of civil rights history, we know that there's a through line. Activism does not end, it just continues and we pass that torch. So Ms. Sawyer, we've seen some of your fights for justice and equality play out quite publicly as a grassroots based politician. Um, and based on your experience, how do you see your role and the role of civic minded individuals staying the same or shifting as we move forward? Hi, yeah, so I mean, I, try to be a truth teller. Um, I am a historian at heart, trained at the University of Memphis by uh, some of the best, shout out to, again, uh, Dr. Bond and uh, the, you know, Ben Hooks Institute and several others. Um, but what I believe activists and politicians have to do, have no choice but to do uh, is if we are truly truly focused on anti-black liberation, anti the eradication of anti-blackness um, and equality in, for uh, black and brown people in Tennessee, we have to use our voices. Too many politicians are afraid to speak up. And that's for several reasons. Dr. G, uh, you know, has talked a lot about the intersection, intersection of like economic insecurities, right? There was a time when you had your Robert Church um, you know, but what we saw Robert Church do uh, with Black political power was sell it out in a certain way. You know, he was aligned with Boss Crump, uh, who was a rabid racist until Boss Crump became jealous of uh, Church and uh, took his land and, and ran his children out of town. Um, and, uh, you know, we see the same thing now where Black politicians, we mentioned the Fords, a uh, great family. Uh, however, you know, at some point, because so many Black electives come from uh, poverty, uh, at some point they choose the economics over the liberation aspect. Um, I say to people often that one thing that people would never guess is a privilege and a benefit of mine is I was raised middle class and, um, you know, went to some, went to private school here, you know, um, which gave me a fearlessness, right? Because my voice wasn't tied to a job, you know, uh, where it's for me, it was like, 
yeah, there's nobody you can call to fire me. So <laughs> I'm gonna spit these facts. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna tweet these tweets. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I can remember being an elected official and folks being like tweeting the mayor. And I'm like, the mayor's not my boss. Learn civics, you know. <laughs> but tweet Lee Harris all you want. <laughs> he's he's just screenshotting and texting it back to me. Like, please get this one. <laughs> I follow you on Twitter and I live for your tweets. So continue. <laughs> but I say that, you know, I think, you know, um, that we have no choice no matter what our economic standing is, no matter what our privileges are as Black electeds or as electeds of any uh, identity who are committed to uh, liberation because, I mean, we're literally in an apocalypse, if you ask me. I mean, we, we can all define it differently. Pre-apocalypse, I've, I've had this debate on social media before, like where in, uh, you know, your favorite apocalyptic novel are you? Uh, and so like, for me, we are like pre-giver, uh, pre-prequel of, um, uh, the Hunger Games were somewhere like we're watching the districts be formed as we speak. Um, and what you'll see is that we always wonder how these things happen. How did Hitler rise to power uh, in Nazi Germany? Uh, you know, how does Stalin eradicate, um, you know, entire communities in Russia? How, how does any of this happen? And you look up and you realize people were refusing to use their voice. Um, you know, we hate Nazis now, but the United States and the United Kingdom admired, financially supported, uh, colluded with uh, Nazi Germany until it became too horrific for them to do so any longer. Um, and so we're seeing the same thing. And what has always been a agent, the most powerful change agent in history for me is people willing to use their voice and their bodies. And we are at that point where if you're in office, you can't be afraid, am I going to get elected in four years? Because in four years, uh, if we don't use our voices and our, and our feet, you know, if we're not marching, if we're not speaking out, because right now in the state legislature, all that Democrats can do is speak out. They don't have a majority. All that Black electeds can do is speak out. Uh, they don't have a majority. All that women can do is speak out. They don't have a majority. So what are you colluding for with people who are working to take away uh, your basic rights, re-enslave, um, recreate a second class to industry, uh, and in a very violent way, what are you colluding for? Uh, because they're not going to save you when it all is said and done. Uh, so if Justin Pearson and Justin Jones want to shut down Tennessee legislature every day for the next four years, I'm over here uh, with it because that's the power that we have. Um, and it's why Ida B. Wells picked up a pen. It's, you know, and, and decided to write uh, and tell those stories. Otherwise, uh, she was she would have been not just a witness, but a participant um, in the violent racial eradication of her community. And that's how you drop your mic. I ain't mad at you. <laughs> um, I have no comment to follow that up. Absolutely. I. I think that this work is it's a calling and it's passion based work. And you, this is not something that you do because you want followers on social media. This is the type of work you do because you actually believe in equality and you actually believe that it is possible. Um, with that being said, last but not least, as we've looked back, what is now necessary for media entities to continue to move the needle, so to say, so to say, as it relates to accurate and empathetic reporting of Black West Tennessee, West Tennessee issues and stories? Um, I think there's several things. Um, there's what I mentioned earlier about um, being skeptical about official narratives, um, which seems like a given, but is not a given. Um, I think when it comes to Black-led media, um, it's really specialized in being able to um, share um, a lot of stories about our culture, about just who we are as a community, um, it, which is beautiful and so needed because there's there's a, a gap that, that Black media has to fill um, that hasn't been told. But I think um, kind of the, the next level to be able to um, 
move the needle, as you said, would be to do more investigative stories that um, un uncover what it means to um, uh, see inequalities, not just on an individual le level, but on a structural level. Um, and so I think being able to um, dive deep into what that looks like, because I think um, going back to probably say the, the 90s onward, this kind of colorblind, um, you know, all racism is individual, um, that mentality is still with us in a lot of ways uh, in the majority culture. And so being able to use journalism as a way to dissect the structural issues to understand that Yes, there is individual racism, but there's a lot of structural racism that we as a society still don't quite have um, a grasp on how to explain that well and and dissect it. And I think journalism is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the reasons that I got into this work with Civil Wrongs, the podcast that we mentioned earlier, um, because um, so what I heard a lot, especially after the murder of George Floyd was a lot of people asking, well, how did we get here? And a lot of people could answer that, but they weren't listening for, for decades, but um, recognizing that, that that is answerable and that um, we can um, really explain how we get from point A to point B, um, because that has been denied us in, school, in schooling, that has been denied us um, in just the public sphere, um, whether it's, uh, politics, economics, like there hasn't been an adequate uh, resources to be able to um, explain that uh, that through line. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would be my response. And I think there's a lot of great work happening, but there just needs m so much more of it um, mm -hmm. to be able to actually move forward. Uh -huh. And I just quickly add, I think that Black media has to recognize a responsibility, um, <clears throat> a, a, a twofoldness, you know, again, just speaking back to Ida B. Wells, um, you know, using your journalism uh, to create change. So MLK 50, the work that uh, Laura has done uh, in, in, in all the iterations uh, of her work, um, whether at Chalkbeat or elsewhere, um, it, it, it's why journalism for black people has to be a justice tool. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the bossips and the shade rooms. I've been laughing at uh, Diddy for the last 24 hours. I think it's the funniest SHIT I've ever seen in my life. However, <laughs> let's balance that with the fact that, you know, a bridge collapsed and all people could say is called the black mayor of Baltimore, the DEI mayor, and blame him. Um, you know, let let's challenge those those optics and have those conversations at the same time. Like I'm definitely wondering where Diddy is, and I also want to hear Black media discuss the fact that a bridge was destroyed in a majority outside of a majority Black city led by a Black mayor with a Black governor in a state with a Black governor. Um, and they're using the word DEI as a racial slur now. On the same day that Idaho, a 93% uh, white state banned diversity statements across the state. Um, so I wanna see Shade Room talk about both. I wanna see Bossip talk about both um, because for all of the wonderful work of MLK50 and Chalkbeat, they don't get 50 million followers like Shade Room and Bossip, right? Uh, reel them in with a joke about Diddy, and next thing you know, you've got them talking about why is Idaho's 95% white state self banning diversity statements? What's what's happening here? And so I just want to say that I, I, I want Black media to realize that, unfortunately, to whom much is given, much is required, and you have a responsibility to help people understand their history and the current times that they are in politically. Thanks for letting me add on. No problem at all. We do have to hold one another accountable. And that also goes to our media and any other affiliate of black culture that profits off of our culture. They should also be held accountable for making sure that our culture grows and succeeds. Well, I want to thank 
each and every one of you for your time this evening and for your commentary. It means the most to me. It means the most to Humanities Tennessee and to all of the viewers that we have watching this evening. And before I let you go, we also have one last video that comes from the Weekly County Reconciliation Project, because we really want to also understand what, how does this affect rural West Tennesseans? Because the urban experience is just one experience, but the rural experience sometimes can be a little bit deeper. So we're going to let the Weekly County Reconciliation Project uh, representative tell you about the work that they're doing and also tell you about some of the challenges that they're facing to do the work that is very much so needed. Hi, I'm Carol from the Weekly County Reconciliation Project. Uh, WCRP started about five and a half years ago uh, when a few different clusters of people found each other primarily uh, as a result of the efforts of a group of nine people from a, one of the churches in Martin who had uh, traveled together to EJI in Montgomery, the Equal Justice Initiative um, Museum and Memorial to lynching victims. So they had such a powerful experience, they wanted to share it with the community and then other groups, smaller groups of people who had also been to EJI came and then um, one thing led to another. The group started to meet uh, monthly. We, there was a book group also that's still going that has been reading books about race. We started with uh, Black Reconstruction in America by W.E.B. Du Bois. That took us almost a year. It's pretty big. Um, we've read several books since then. Now we meet over Zoom because some of our people are as far away as Florida and um, we also have done community meetings. Sometimes there's a speaker, sometimes it's just discussion. COVID set us back uh, quite a bit. And so we are still trying to find a rhythm for community meetings and regain the momentum that we had before COVID. Because of our connection or, or origins in EJI's projects, we started out wanting to uh, do um, or establish uh, historical markers at the sites of lynchings in Weekly County. And that has turned out to be a much slower process than we hoped in the beginning. Um, one of the challenges we face is that mo almost all of our active members live in Martin in um, the, none of the lynchings of, in Weekly County happen in Martin. So the little communities where we would need to collect soil and put up markers um, are, are less excited about this project than we are. They, uh, I think the rest of Weekly County may consider Martin kind of an outlier because there's a university here and um, it's kind of a town gown. Um, situation between Martin and the rest of Weekly County. So anyway, we have been looking for ways to meet in other parts of the county and get other people involved who are not from Martin. Um, we also have encountered some um, reluctance, I would say, from um, even Black residents of Weekly County who are not sure that what we're doing is going to benefit them. Um, I was told by a mentor who is uh, part of the Lynching Sites Project in Memphis that in Northwest Tennessee, the, um, the rate of lynchings in proportion to the population is uh, as high as Memphis or higher, even though the raw numbers were lower. But just because the population is small, the rate turns out to be higher. And he's also told me that in rural counties where the black population is 8% or so or less, it's very hard for um, black residents to feel safe um, per, um, speaking up in favor of things like this because there are no black employers, there are no black school board members, no black county commissioners. The whole world is white. So when I have called people, um, I think some of sometimes they have seen me as, I came to think of it as Goldilocks, like I'm coming in to 
try everything out and I'm going to end up breaking furniture and leaving them with the broken furniture. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, in along the way, Discovery Park of America, which is in O'Brien County next to us, uh, reached out and asked us to partner with them to uh, put on a Juneteenth celebration. So we're, I think, coming up on our third or fourth year working with them. And so that has um, been a good way for us to establish credibility. Discovery Park is an excellent place um, and with terrific uh, exhibits there. Um, anyway, so there's that. And then we also um, have, we have gone on two trips. Uh, well, the first original trip to Montgomery to the EGI Museum was sort of independent. Then we, we planned another one, which we had to postpone because of COVID. That finally happened in October. We took a full bus load this time. Uh, that was in October last fall, 2023. We're hoping to do that again. And we're currently planning to resume monthly meetings. Uh, well, we had some last year too, but we're, we're trying to get back to um, a regular monthly meeting where people can come to have a safe place to talk about uh, matters of race that are just so hard to talk about. We feel like there's hunger here to do that. The first one we tried before COVID, um, we ended up with 50 people that showed up and sat around tables. We, we had a panel of four speakers who just kind of told their own stories of coming to understand racism and then each table had its own discussion. So that, um, that was great and we hope to do that again. All right. I want to send a big shout out to Carol Cavalier, who's featured in the video. Um, thank you for the time to be so transparent about wanting to do the work and the struggle of doing that work. I think that for many white people who do this type of work, this type of advocacy work, I know there has to be some, some discomfort at times, but I really respect the tenacity and, and the desire to try to make things right, to try to reconcile some of these issues. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to our friends at the Martin County Library who are viewing this live right now. Um, and I do hope that Carol is in the room. I do want to tell you thank you again. We had a wonderful conversation. Other than that, thank you all for attending this evening. Thank you all to our panelists for their time. Um, and thank you to everyone who viewed it. Uh, on behalf of myself and Humanities Tennessee, we are really grateful for your support. And we look forward to seeing you in April for our Middle Tennessee uh, issue of this conversation. Where we'll be looking at uh, cultural competency. So please keep your eyes and ears uh, locked in on all of our correspondence, and we'll make sure that you have all the information available to learn a little bit more about what Middle Tennessee has going on. Um, but thank you so much for your time, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Good night.